Good morning, Hope Church. It's a beautiful day to worship our King, amen? Let's all stand together this morning as we lift our voices to our King. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where your streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Hope Church. Welcome, and I want to say happy Mother's Day to the mothers that are here with us today. If this is your first time, relax and make yourself at home. You should have received a bulletin when you came in. Bulletin has a communication card. You can use that for any prayer requests or to give us your contact information. Be sure to look for ongoing and upcoming ministries um, and events in the bulletin and on our ministry table. Rock the Ridge 20 is scheduled for June 3rd. Yeah. It's going to be a great time, and we cannot do this without you. 
Rock the Ridge is a donation-only music festival paid for by Hope that raises money for a local need. This year's local need is going uh, is Paradise High School girls volleyball. So stop by the ministry table and sign up to serve our community at Rock the Ridge 20. Man Camp is coming up June 9th through the 11th. Flyers. Flyers are in your bulletin, and there's a sign-up on the ministries table. At this time, we will have a short meet and greet. Please stand up and say good morning to someone around you.
Father, we praise you today for we know that we stand and we trust that you never leave us, that you are always with us no matter what we face in life. So we praise you today for who you are and what you've done. May our singing, may our worship, may our learning from your word be an offering to you, God, as we lay our hearts before you.
honor him today in our worship. We honor him by taking communion as a family. You are free to participate in communion at any time during this next song. As the ushers pass out the cracker and juice, I encourage you to reflect in your heart. Communion is a time that we commune and remember the sacrifice of Jesus as a family and as individual children. Please participate how God shaped you for worship. You may stand, sit, kneel, sing, cry, pray, whatever God places on your heart as we commune as a family of believers and we remember our brother and our friend, our savior and our king, Jesus.
Hey, Hope Church, are you glad to be here today? Yeah. Amen. It's good to see you. Thank you for being here in person and online. We are one church. Let's give it up for Hope Rising. You may have noticed that uh, some of our musicians are here but not up here today. And uh, Howard's sitting in the back somewhere, although he was doing a little bit earlier. But that's because Gina Darby, who is a disciple maker, uh, wants the team to be able to have a day to just worship and be a part of the church family. And I love that because they're not our entertainers. They're our brothers and sisters. Amen. Yeah. And I love our band. Unplugged or plugged. It's awesome. And I'm thankful for them. Well, Happy Mother's Day to all our moms. Yeah, we want to, uh, I have a gift for you uh, after the service. There's a table in the back left under the connection sign. And if you'll go by there after the service, I have a cupcake for you, courtesy of our Beverly. And also a little uh, faith-based bookmarker if you want. And uh, so I wanted to give you something sweet to taste because you're sweet. And you can eat it on, after the service or there's bags back there that will help you put it in a bag if you want to take it with you. Uh, but at this time, I would like to ask all moms to remain seated and everybody else to stand up. All moms remain seated. Everybody else uh, stand up. God has taught always for his people to honor mothers. So right now, let's give our moms an ovation. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, moms. I know, you, I know you deserve a whole lot more, but you can go out today and say, I got a standing ovation today. That's pretty cool. <laughs> Moms are awesome. I want to, we're, we're in a series called Who Needs God? And I'll mention moms here and there, but I'm not doing a, a Mother's Day sermon because my mama always said, preach the word, preach the word. And we're in this series called Who Needs God? I want to share something with you that was given to me. Dear Lord, so far today, I'm doing okay. I have not gossiped, lost my temper, been greedy, grumpy, nasty, selfish, or overindulgent. However, I'm going to get out of bed in a few minutes, and I will need a lot more help after that. How do we know some things are right and some things are wrong? I know our mama taught us. A lot of us did. If you didn't have a mama who taught you right and wrong, uh, you have mamas in the church. That's one of the great things about the church. I have great moms in the faith. Now that my, my mom's gone to heaven, I still have great moms around me. And uh, moms are cool. Moms, they come in all sizes and shapes. And they're in sweats and they're in shorts or they're in business suits. And they, they all say some of the same things. Like, no, don't touch that. Touch that. Put that back. Oh, you've got an owie. And they, no one knows how to help you with an owie like a mom. But they can also say things like, I brought you into this world and I can take you out, right? You know, I read some research that's being done in Edinburgh. They found that a certain type of a beetle mother, not the band, but uh, the bug, a certain type of beetle mother eats her children when they pester her too much. So don't mess with mama, you know? And uh, so uh, we, we want to talk today about something that I know my mom helped me out a lot, but that's uh, justice and injustice. I want you to think about this word injustice because we're in a series and we've been talking about a large population of our adult American population is uh, stepping away from God and stepping away from religion. They're called nuns, not spelled like nuns, Catholic nuns, but nun like I ain't got none. And, th and they won't all say they're atheists, although some go that far. A lot of them don't go that far, and they're stuck in the middle. And on the atheists teach that there's a, a, uni a universe of nothingness, you're a ch chunk of matter floating around, and the other side, the religion thing, is a guilt trip to them or uh, doesn't seem to uh, impact their daily life. And the premise has been every week that if you're part of that uh, population, I want to ask you to consider, to reconsider that maybe you left the wrong thing. Maybe you didn't really have the original faith and the original Jesus and tradition 
or false views of God is what you left. And I don't blame you for leaving that. And we have sometimes done a bad job showing the real God. And I apologize for that. But I'm begging you to reconsider. And today we're dealing with the subject that a lot of people used to say uh, there's no God. They don't believe in God because of suffering in the world. And they say, how can there be a loving God when he allows horrible things, unjust things to happen in this world. And they use that as a reason. It's an age-old question, and it's been in all the books through the years that people try to use that to say God doesn't exist. And the argument kind of revolves around two things. If he's good, he would. And if he could, he would. If God's character is really good, like you're saying, then he would do good things. And there's a lot of bad things in this world. And if his God is all-powerful, like you say, then he could and he would. But since he's not doing anything, then he must not be all-powerful and he must not be good. And so therefore there is no God, they would say. I want to say before I forget, this is a primary first world thing, this whole mad at God, leaving God because of suffering in the world. The United States, uh, Europe, Canada are people who struggle with this whole idea. And if you've traveled very much, and if you've gone to where some of the most intense poverty is, you have found there's also great faith. Sometimes the most incredible suffering produces the greatest faith. In fact, I had a couple in my Bible study this week that shared that they went through a very difficult time that I wouldn't wish on anybody, but they said they drew closer to the Lord and some in their family became believers. And so I want to give you a caution if you take this view about uh, the suffering of the world as an excuse to not believe in God. Don't commandeer other people's suffering because you may insult them. There are some people who found God through their suffering. You, you have every right to struggle with God about your own personal experience, because God is a, we believe he's a relationship, and he's a person, and you have every right. The Bible doesn't show people never getting mad at God. It's the opposite. You have every right, but don't use someone else's suffering to, as an excuse to say there is no God, because that's insulting. If God were good, he would eradicate injustice. If God is good, he could. If he wants to, and he, he doesn't. Where does that leave us? It leaves us, the thinking is, in an unjust world full of inexplicable suffering, worshiping a God who seems to do little about it. How could a good God allow this? How could a loving God let this happen? And here's my point today. There is no rational argument against the existence of the God of Jesus based on injustice in the world. But this is the primary reason people abandon belief in what they think is the God of Jesus. Now, there's reason to be upset with the other faiths or other gods in history uh, be, because things don't go well. In fact, did you know in ancient times, the very fact that you went through suffering, that caused some people to believe in God. Hey, the crops are down. God must be mad at us. We need to sacrifice somebody so God will then give us a good harvest. Ancient people, ancient times, believed in the opposite. They believed because they went through difficulty in an existence of God. But the primary reason that a lot of people today say they don't believe in God, if God's a loving God, he would help out. Christians have never made the argument for the existence of God based on a world where if you believe in this loving God, he'll never allow bad things to happen to good people. Christians have never made that argument that that is a reason for the existence of God. Injustice in the world calls into question the justice of God, but not the existence there's a difference between existence of God and your experience. 
it makes more sense for you to be angry at God than to be an atheist. If my, if, if I, my kids told you, man, my dad, he doesn't provide for us, he doesn't protect us, he doesn't treat us good, he doesn't love us, he doesn't show us any affection, you're not going to say, well, I guess Stan doesn't exist. You're going to say he sucks as a dad, but he exists. So we can't take the, the I, and I understand, I don't want to be condescending. If you're really struggling with belief in God because you're going through a tough time, I, I, underst- I, I don't blame you. I'm not here to blame anybody. I just want to reason with people that are turning their back on God because there's uh, bad things. And you may, maybe should be angry, but that doesn't mean that God doesn't exist. Now here's a question I want us to think about. A really important question. Why do we assume if there is a God that he must be good and he must be just? Where did that idea come from? Our mama? You know, my mama taught me when I stole something one time I saw this really cool camel knife in a store and it was crying out to me, take me home. And I took it home. And she caught me out front of the house with this brand new knife. She said, where'd you get that? And I went, oh, I found it. And she's like, don't you ever lie to me. It's always worse if you lie. She taught me very young to fess up. I said, I stole it. She goes, okay, let's go and get in the car. We go to the downtown. She walks me into my dad's barbershop, four chair shop. And I understand now my dad was trying not to laugh, but he's trying to act serious. But she, she said, tell your father what you did. And I had to tell my dad, big as life in front of all the other barbers and guys in there. And then she goes, all right, come on, we're going to the store. And all those men are coming. And we go to the store and my mom calls the manager out tell the manager what you did. And I had to tell the manager. It was frightening. But I learned a good lesson about f- stealing and uh, truth. And she always said, Pay the, if you did something wrong, admit it and take care of, of whatever it takes to, to pay the price, even if it's a, a night in jail. And uh, so I learned a lot of good things. But where did she get that? Where did your, your mama get that? My my. My wife had me out pulling weeds yesterday, you know, and because she has this strong sense of taking care of stuff and doing things right. And my kids, they just respect her. She's the glue in the family. Where, 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 did they, where did they get that? Where did you get your idea of right and wrong? Somebody told you. To leverage injustice against God's existence is to assume that God must be good and just by our standard of good and just. Why do we assume if there is a God that God must be good and just? Somebody told us. Now, we're making two assumptions. We, assumptions. we know what God must be like, and we know uh, good and just um, exist, that there is a standard based on what? The pharaohs didn't teach that God is just and treats all human beings with dignity. It was the opposite. Julius Caesar didn't teach that everyone is equal and there's good in the universe and we're here to treat people, all people, with dignity. If a Roman man woke up in the morning and wanted to have sex with one of his slaves, he did. Nobody got on to him for that. Where did this idea about justice and doing good come from? Nature? Nature is not nice. Nature, biology, is neutral. It's not about good or bad, injustice, justice. It's neutral. The ancient gods uh, were not nice. They were not fair. They were not predictable. In fact, they thought they were unpredictable and they were immoral. Ancient Jewish people believed that God loved them, but he didn't like other people. (laughs) Islam permits God to do as God pleases, and we have no right to build uh, accountability for God. Uh, he, He does what God does what God wants, and we have these misguided ideas that God wills it, and it must be, he does it because he can do whatever he wants, and Buddhism teaches there is no God, and Hinduism uh, is not 
monotheistic. It doesn't have a one God strictly in the strict sense. And your life reflects a former life. And there's nothing about, you know, there's karma. There's, there's no uh, justice and injustice. Where, where did the idea come from? Wishful thinking? Somebody told us about a God who is good and just, that, co- that loves all, pe- all people. Jesus Christ introduced justice and dignity for all. That version of God came from Jesus Christ. Oh, I just, uh, my God's a loving God. Well, where'd you get that? You think you're original with that? My God, which a lot of time means the God that does what I want him to do, he's a loving God. But you're not original. You're not unique. The notion that God must be a loving entity committed to global justice and fairness is strictly Christian thinking. That's why I'm begging people to reconsider Christianity. I know some of you have bad church experience or you've been mistreated uh, and struggled with with organized religion, yet go to the, the original version of Jesus Christ. I, I think it's amazing uh, that Christianity survived in the most unjust of times, and it thrives. And we grow up with this, uh, thank you God, God is good, God is great, thank you for this food, doesn't rhyme, but... Uh, but by his hand we are fed. Uh, we thank him for our daily bread. That rhymes. Amen, right? We, where, where did this stuff come from? The notion that God must be a loving God and cares about global justice and fairness is from Christ. And so, our Western, U.S., uh, generalized expectation of God comes directly from the New Testament. If you believe God is love and loves everybody, you got that from Christianity, whether you're a Christian or not. Before God, before Jesus, there were local gods who cared about the local people, was in their business, and taking care of their business. And a guy named John sat down. Some scholars say Jesus quoted it. He was quoting Jesus. Others say, no, John wrote it. doesn't matter. But he sits down. We've heard it so much. We're so used to it. It's on signs at football games and events and on cups for God. So loved. Uh, I, want to, I want to say the Jews, <laughs> nationally, you know, the way I grew up, I forgot to love the Jews. But, but after hanging around Jesus, God so loved the world, that was unheard of. And John, his closest friends were martyred for their faith. You talk about injustice. They were killed because they just believed something. And John still writes, my God, that I learned from Jesus, loves the world. We've got Elizabeth among us today. Elizabeth just graduated from Azusa Pacific, a great Christian school. You're going to hear more about it later, but I can't keep my mouth shut because I'm so proud. She's going into the mission field. She's going to a foreign country. Why do you want to do that, Elizabeth? It's all about America. You know, to be a Christian, a white, you know, Republican, or pick your party, Democrat, whatever. That's what Jesus was about. No, Jesus was about the whole world. And I love this country. I can't believe I was born here. My grandpa came here with nothing. My grandma came from the Great Depression, and I love America. But God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. You can't go around, oh, I just, I believe in a loving God. I don't like Jesus. I don't like Christianity. That's real popular now to not like Christianity. But you're not being consistent because Jesus is the one that gave you that idea. And John wrote in 1 John 4, 7 and 8, we touched on this last week. Dear friends, let us love one another for love comes from God. What? The gods? The gods are mean some... No, I'm not talking about the gods, the Greek gods, the Roman gods. I'm talking about the God of Jesus. And he is the source of love. And John is writing this when he's risking his life 
John is writing this at a time when Christianity suffered the most. For 300 years, it was terrible injustice in the world. Women were treated like property. Kids sometimes weren't named because they didn't know if they were going to keep them around very long. Terrible, unjust times. And the Christian movement grew before the Bible. The Bible's not even put together yet. Why? Because they learned it from Jesus that God is love. And Jesus rose from the grave. He says, whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. <laughs> little acid test there. John said, I don't care how much Bible you can quote and how much you go to church. If you do not love, you don't know God because God is love. His life's at risk, being treated unjustly. And still he says, God is love. Don't think Christianity is fragile. Christianity is not fragile. The faith in the Lord is not fragile. Because the early believers went through horrible, horrible persecution and they thrived. The terror that stalks my mind. This is written from an atheist. This is, you've probably heard of, of Hawking, Stephen Hawking's physicist. He said this in, in, at Oxford at some lectures, and I want you to hear it. It's all over the net. You can look at the full speech, but I wanted you to hear a segment because this is what happens if we just go to nature and trust nature. He says, the terror that stalks my mind is that we have arrived on the scene because of evolution. He's talking about the human race. Because of naturalistic selection. What is it, Stephen, that keeps you up at night? Why is this bothering you, a believer in natural selection, natural law? Why is this bothering you? He says, a natural selection assumes nat natural rejection. Which means we have arrived here because of our aggression. That's why you hear it called survival of the fittest. He says we got where we are by aggression. Now here's what he says needs to happen with human beings. Our only hope is for mankind is that we can be able to move to other planets in our galaxy and split up. Because if we stay together on the same planet, we're going to annihilate ourselves. That from scientists in someone who believes and understands the process of natural selection. I like to use survival of the fittest. That's, that helps me understand it. Some of you have a scientific mind and understand a lot more about it than I do. But at best, at best, uh, nat the natural way is tolerant. Like when a mountain lion looks at you and goes, mm, I'm not going to eat you today. I'll eat you later. That's, that's the natural way. And the best way, this, I just can't, I, can't I don't know how to word this enough, good enough, but the best way to rid the world of injustice is to get rid of God. To get rid of the God of Jesus. Because when God walks out the door, there goes justice. And there goes the standard. And w once there's no objective standard for uh, justice and injustice, it ceases to exist, would be the thinking or the logic. If we could just get rid of the God of Jesus, there would be no more injustice. And at best, we're left with my justice and your justice, and Nazi justice, and ISIS justice, and majority justice, and clan justice, and nature's justice, and street justice, and rich justice, and power justice. And we go back to the ancient world where might is right, and whoever has the most gold makes all the rules. There's no basis for human dignity when everything is reduced to biology and Jesus brought us God is love does Jesus have a solution though yeah but we don't like it we don't like it because there's not just love that God brings uh, 
he also, with justice, there's judgment. Oh, I don't want to hear the judgment stuff. I don't want to hear about a judgmental God. My God is just love. And you cannot have justice without judgment. And I don't like that. I want it for you. I'm okay with you having judgment, but I need mercy. I know how bad I am. And so we don't like to talk about judgment. I don't like to talk about it. I fear it. But I got good news. God sent a Savior, not just a judge. The gospel is the most awesome narrative. The gospel where you admit you're a sinner and you admit God's standard and you humble yourself to your creator, creator God and receive grace is the greatest news there is. Who could think up such a story in a narrative? The gospel is what we need. And Jesus comes and he says, there will be a judgment day. And God will make all things right. My mama used to quote Paul. For we know that God works all things for the good, for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Jesus said, I did not come to judge the world, even though the world needs judgment. I did not come to judge the world, even though there's so much injustice and horrible things happening because of free will and human beings and the brokenness. I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. In Luke 18, you know, Jesus would tell these parables, which are stories uh, with spiritual truths. And he's telling this story about a woman who comes to the judge. And the judge doesn't fear God. And the judge doesn't care about people. And he says, this woman just keeps coming to that judge saying, I need you. I need justice. I need you to help me with this cause that I have. And the guy doesn't care. He doesn't care about people. He doesn't fear God. But he gets tired of her begging and begging. And finally he goes, okay, the only way to get her off my back is to hear her case and give her justice. And Jesus says this. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? And some of you feel right now that God is putting you off. And you keep crying out, God, why? Why? And you're having to wait. And you're having to wait. He says, I tell you, he will see in his time. He will see that they get justice. And quickly, however, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Will he find faith like those in the first century Christianity? I tell you what, I need this Jesus. I need this God of love. I don't need some new age crap. I don't need some touchy-feely stuff. I need the love of God that comes only from Jesus. And I'm not ashamed of that. I found the best thing there is, the pearl of great price. And think about this. If anyone had a reason to stop believing in God because of injustice, it was Jesus. He died on a cross. He stands at the center of us all who are believers. And he was treated extraordinarily, unfairly. And today there's billions who say they believe in Jesus. Evil and injustice are not arguments against the existence of God. They are evidence that we need God. Oh, the world needs God. Tim Keller is a great pastor who's dying from pancreatic cancer. I watch his podcast. He says, I've never felt closer to God and enjoyed my prayer time. My wife and I talking to God. He predicts that things are going to get worse for a while like they are right now against faith. But he says people will find out how shallow that is and they're going to come back. Don't leave. If you're thinking about it, reconsider. If you genuinely care about justice, You should want Christianity to be true. And I'll close with C.S. Lewis, Mere Christianity. He says, quote, If I find myself in a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. Let's pray together. 
Oh, Father, I thank you so much that you're a God of love. And we sing that because we believe there's nothing we can do to make you love us more. There's nothing we can do to make you love us less. And no matter what challenges we go through in this life, this is temporary and you are God. You are our creator. Thank you for invading the world and bringing love and for Jesus and for all the, the word and all the help that you give us, your spirit, God. We commit to not make that excuse. We may get angry at you sometimes because you're real, but you can handle it. But you exist. And we praise you at this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and worship God. great song. Hey, let's give it up for Hope Rising. Thank you. Thanks, buddy. Appreciate it. So, Gina, we've got a lot going on. Yes, we do. We've got Rock the Ridge coming up. That's right. We have the Raffle Extraordinaire in the house. R raffle Extraordinaire, Chuck. Right and uh, Chuck says, bring stuff for the raffle. If you want to get a letter uh, that has our eye our number that you can show uh, that we're a church and we're nonprofit, and, uh, and they you, can we write got, it off on their taxes. They can write it. Yeah, thank you. And there's uh, flyers back there. I got some bigger ones in case anybody wants to use those. And then bring the stuff here. Hugh Chuck wants it all brought here, right, Chuck? Is that right? Yeah, okay. I can figure out what we got. And how we're going to do the how we're going to do the raffle. So. He's he's got some of his neighbors already donating money for him to buy stuff. Isn't that awesome? Awesome. Yeah, that's so cool. That's so cool. 
right, you want to say more on Rock All right, yeah, so what I'd like to do is I would like to remind you that it has been a number of years since we have hosted a Rock the Ridge in Paradise. We have a lot of new community out there that doesn't really know what it is. So, Hope, I charge you with telling them about it. Yeah. Take those flyers, spread them around. People are excited about it, and they will be happy yeah. to hear that there's something going on. This community is really getting tight, and they like to party. So I yeah. charge you to be part of our marketing team, okay? Amen. I'm glad you said that. You know, when we started, uh, it, it was a time in history. A lot of people did mail-outs, postcards, and I said, let's be living postcards. And that's how we started, uh, by word of mouth, and it grew. So thank you for saying that, yeah. And we are seeing some sign-ups, too. So that's really exciting, for people to volunteer. Yeah, keep signing up. Yeah, yeah. We have groups, a couple more weeks. If you haven't been going to group, no one's going to go, no, now you come. We'll be glad you came. So check that out this week. Uh, someone has a need in the community for a wheelchair ramp. Uh, but we, we need a general contractor before we can do that. So if there's anyone here that do, is a general contractor, let us know after service uh, so we could help this person out. And anything else? Not sounds forgetting? great. Okay, okay. Uh, right now it's time to pray for our offering. Yeah. <laughs> if you'd like to give online, you can do that at hopechurchparadise.com. And uh, let's pray. Father, thank you. We got up this morning because of you. We do pray that all moms have an awesome time. We pray for anyone that's sad, that this is a sad day to feel your love and comfort. Uh, to be able to get with a believer or someone that loves them and encourage them. And uh, Father, continue please to make us a force of hope on the ridge and beyond that brings you glory. That's our only aim in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah. Hey, before we give, what is our purpose? Building yeah. relationships that last forever. How do we do that? Love God. Love people. So remember, every single day this week in Christ, we always have hope.
wonderful Mother's Day. We love you very much.